on World News Tonight. Backing down. Has China really stopped its Taiwan-based drills? Or is it just a tactic to confuse Taipei? More news on this tonight. Falling growth. The World Bank forecasts that the global growth rate will fall to 1.7%. More strikes. Britain races for unparalleled disruption of doctors' strike as young medical workers plan to go on strikes. And dreams of dance. Young Ukrainian water dancers take to the stage to prove that they deserve a spot in next year's Olympic Games. is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening to all our viewers and we lead off tonight with the tensions between China and Taiwan. Taipei states that Chinese ships will remain around Taiwanese waters as China nominally wraps up its three days of war games. The Taiwanese Defense Ministry reports that nine Chinese warships as well as more than two dozen military jets were spotted around Taiwanese borders as late as today morning. China ended three days of military drills around Taiwan on Monday. It said it had tested integrated military capabilities under actual combat conditions having practiced precision strikes and blockading the island that Beijing views as its own. Beijing announced the drills on Saturday after Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen returned to Taipei following a meeting in Los Angeles with U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Kevin McCarthy. The Chinese military said it had successfully completed the exercises and, quote, comprehensively tested the capabilities of multiple units. China's People's Liberation Army on Sunday put out this short animation of simulated attacks on Taiwan on its WeChat account. The Eastern Theater Command of the PLA said its aircraft carrier, the Shandong, also took part in combat patrols and showed fighters taking off from its deck. Taiwan has been tracking the Shandong since last week in the Pacific Ocean. Taiwanese fighter jets could be seen taking off and landing at an airbase in the island's north. The country's military has repeatedly said it will respond calmly to China's drills and not provoke conflict. In Shanghai, people were broadly supportive of the drills. Meanwhile, in Pingtung, Taiwan's southern tip, many said they were largely unfazed. <laughs> we're used to it by now, it's no big deal. It's been like this for years. China has just been like that, one man said, adding that people are nervous but not worried. <laughs> International powers, including the United States, say they've been closely watching the drills. A top government spokesperson for Japan said the country has been following China's military drills around Taiwan with great interest. The European Union has also expressed concern, saying on Monday that Taiwan's status should not be changed by force, as any escalation, accident or use of force there would have huge global implications. China has never renounced the use of force to bring the democratically governed island under Beijing's control. Taiwan's government strongly disputes China's claims and has condemned the drills. The U.S. Intel leak is one of the most damaging since the WikiLeaks incidents a decade ago. The leak documents have landed the U.S. in diplomatic hot waters over allegations of U.S. spying on allied nations. U.S. officials on Monday were scrambling to identify the source of what could be the most damaging leak of highly classified intelligence since the WikiLeaks publication of thousands of government documents a decade ago. At a press briefing at the White House, U.S. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said they were working on getting to the bottom of it. We're taking this very, very seriously. There is uh, uh, no uh, excuse for these kinds of documents to be in the public domain. They don't deserve to be they, in, the, in the public domain. They deserve to be protected. If there's actions that need to be taken, uh, as we learn more about the extent of what happened here, we'll obviously take those. Three U.S. officials told that national security agencies were reviewing how they share their most sensitive secrets inside the U.S. government after the recent release of dozens of confidential documents that appeared online and are dealing with the diplomatic fallout. Some of the most sensitive information is purportedly related to Ukraine's military capabilities and shortcomings. Information about multiple U.S. allies were also leaked. One of the documents gave details of internal discussions among senior South Korean officials about U.S. pressure on Seoul to supply weapons to Ukraine and its policy of not doing so. On Monday, South Korean lawmakers said they, quote, 
strongly regret that the U.S. had been illegally spying on allies. He reviewed more than 50 of the documents labeled secret and top secret that first appeared on social media sites in March. Reuters has not independently verified the authenticity of the documents. I won't speak to the validity of all the documents, uh, the, the ones that, uh, you know, that, that, that don't Im immediately appear to be doctored. We're still working through the validity of uh, all the documents that we know are, are out there. The Department of Justice, meanwhile, has opened a criminal investigation into the disclosure of the documents. Although the release appears to be the most serious public leak of classified information in years, officials say it so far does not reach the scale and scope of the 700,000 documents, videos, and diplomatic cables that appeared on the WikiLeaks website in 2013. Switzerland part-time members of parliament have been called back to Bern for an extraordinary session to debate and vote on the liquidity lifeline given to Credit Suisse. While not able to stop the financial guarantees the Swiss government has given, they could possibly attach uh, conditions to them. Last month, Swiss authorities announced that UBS would buy Credit Suisse in the shotgun merger to stem further banking turmoil after the smaller lender had come to the brink of collapse. After a run on the deposits, the Swiss government had turned to UBS, which agreed to buy Credit Suisse for $3.3 billion, while the Alpine state put up more than 200 billion francs of support and guarantees. The move angered not only shareholders, but many in Switzerland. A survey by political research firm GFS Bern found a majority of Swiss did not support the deal that could create a financial institution, which assets double the size of the country's annual economic output. The World Bank has revised its 2023 global economic outlook from 1.7% to 2%. Reasons behind the improvement include an improved forecast for China's recovery from COVID-19 lockdowns. But the chiefs of the World Bank and the IMF warn geopolitical tensions will put a heavy burden on the economy and trade. With the World Bank's and International Monetary Fund's spring meetings kicking off on Monday, World Bank Group President David Malpass says the global lender has revised its 2023 global growth outlook slightly upwards. Speaking at a media briefing on the same day, Malpass says the World Bank revised its 2023 growth forecast from the previous 1.7 percent to 2 percent, mainly due to an improved outlook for China's recovery from COVID-19 lockdowns. The World Bank chief also noted that advanced economies like the U.S. and those in Europe are faring a bit better than the World Bank anticipated in their January Global Economic Prospects report. However, Malpass also warned that volatility in the banking sector and higher oil prices could yet again put downward pressure on growth prospects in the second half of 2023. He also noted that a slowdown from stronger 2022 global economic growth will increase debt distress for developing countries. During the session with Malpass and IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gargeva, the two chiefs pointed out that geopolitical conflicts, like the situation in Ukraine, are putting a heavy burden on the economy and trade. Gergeva went as far as to say that the division caused by geopolitical conflicts is one of the biggest challenges the world economy needs to solve. Malpass, on the other hand, raised concerns over developing countries which have experienced capital outflows due to interest rate hikes. He also added that developing countries are suffering greatly from debt burdens, climate change, rising food prices and slowing growth. Global economic issues will continue to be discussed during the 2023 spring meetings of the World Bank Group and the International Monetary Fund, which takes place from April 10th to the 16th in Washington, D.C. In an attempt to enforce a dress code mandate, the Iranian police have announced the installation of cameras to identify and punish women who flout the state's hijab laws. Iranian police say cameras are going up in public areas to identify and punish women who are not wearing veils. The move marks a further attempt to rein in the growing number of women defying the country's compulsory dress code. In a statement, police said offenders will get, quote, warning text messages as to the consequences. The statement adds that the move is aimed at preventing resistance against the hijab law. On the streets of Tehran, the news got tepid reception. Well, it's a truth that you need to abide by, the hijab laws, says this woman, adding, but something that is forced is never pleasant. 
Another says other matters are surely more important, like economic matters and the conditions of people. Under Iran's Islamic Sharia law, women are obliged to cover their hair and wear long, loose-fitting clothes to disguise their figures. But a growing number of women have been ditching their veils since the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini while in morality police custody last September. She had been detained for allegedly violating the rule. Security forces have violently quashed protests in the wake of her death. Although there is a risk of being arrested, women are still widely seen without veils in shops, restaurants and malls. We're going into a short commercial break now. More news on the other side. Stay with us. Welcome back now over to the United Kingdom. Junior doctors in Britain began a four-day strike over pay that is likely to cause unprecedented disruption to the health service, prompting the government to warn of a risk to patient safety. Tens of thousands of junior doctors, qualified physicians who make up nearly half of the medical workforce, are striking for pay rises better aligned with inflation in the latest disruption to affect the state-funded National Health Service. The British Medical Association, the union representing doctors, wants a 35% rise, arguing that members have suffered a 26% real terms cut in pay over 15 years. Tuesday's walkout followed a three-day doctor strike last month. The NHS England National Medical Doctor Stephen Powers said this round of strikes will see unparalleled levels of disruption and voiced concern about the potential severity of impact on patients and services across the country. He said there will be considerably more cancellations in operations and procedures this time than the 175,000 that were rescheduled during the previous walkout, but added that the NHS was working to ensure emergency services kept intact. The BMA has said strikes by junior doctors, some of whom are very experienced, could be stopped if Health Minister Steve Barclay put a credible pay offer forward. He says the BMA's demands are unreasonable and would mean an increase of more than £20,000 for some doctors. The strike is the latest to involve NHS staff, following walkouts by nurses, paramedics and others demanding rises that better reflect annual inflation running at more than 10%. The Japanese government has released its diplomatic blue book for this year. However, while it made reference to South Korea's plan to compensate victims of Japan's wartime forced labor, it omitted its previous pledge to hold apologies made in the past. Last month, the South Korean government announced its plan to compensate Korean victims of Japan's wartime forced labor through a public foundation, instead of through the Japanese firms found guilty by a South Korean court. At the time, Japan's foreign minister said he hoped the solution would help restore ties between the countries and said the Japanese government will continue to uphold the apologies it made in the past. On this occasion, we confirm that the Japanese government continues to uphold the stance on historical recognition made by previous cabinets as a whole, including the joint declaration between Japan and South Korea made in October 1998. But this was not included in Japan's newly published Diplomatic Blue Book, an annual report on Japan's foreign policy and activities, released on Tuesday. Regarding the issue of compensating wartime forced labor victims, the report explained that Seoul and Tokyo have been discussing it since President Yoon song yeol took office in May, through diplomatic channels and at the recent summit between the two countries' leaders. But the report did not explain the fact that Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi has said the Japanese government will uphold the stance made by previous cabinets, including the joint declaration between South Korea and Japan in 1998. The joint statement in 1998 between former South Korean President Kim Dae-jung and former Japanese Prime Minister Keizo Obuchi includes Tokyo's, quote, deep remorse and heartfelt apology for causing tremendous damage and suffering to Koreans during its colonial rule. The latest report also said South Korea has continued an illegal occupation of Tokto Island, which they refer to as Takeshima, with no legal basis. Japan has been saying this in its annual diplomatic blue book for six years, since 2018. In response, South Korea's foreign ministry spokesperson said in a statement on Tuesday that Japan should immediately retract the unjust sovereignty claim to what is an integral part of South Korean territory historically, geographically and under international law. The ministry also called in Naoki Kumagai, the deputy chief of mission at the Japanese embassy in Seoul, to protest. 
For the fourth straight day, North Korea has not been answering regularly held daily inter-Korean phone calls. The South Korean government believes it's a one-sided cutoff from its counterpart across the border. North Korea has on Monday remained unresponsive to routine calls with South Korea for the fourth day in a row. Accordingly, Seoul believes Pyongyang has unilaterally cut all communication. During the weekend, the North did not respond via the military communication line, and this morning there was no response from the liaison office and the military communication line. For now, we are putting more weight on the possibility of a unilateral blockade by the North. The Unification Ministry on Monday added it will review how to respond while monitoring the situation closely. The inter-Korean liaison communication channel and a military hotline are normally used twice a day, but there has been no response via either since Friday. It is unclear why the North remains unresponsive, but an expert says Pyongyang's move appears to be in protest of the ongoing security cooperation between Seoul and Washington. The expert did point out, however, that this measure should not be regarded as the North's determination to carry out a substantial measure of retaliation or provocation, as it may only be a warning. The ministry adds this is the first time that calls have stopped for longer than a day since communications were restored in October 2021. Prior to that period, North Korea had cut off cross-border communication for about two months in protest of the Seoul-Washington joint military drills. The Italian Coast Guard has commenced operations to rescue almost 1,200 migrants stranded in the Mediterranean. The situation is particularly dire for one ship carrying 400 migrants on board, which has run out of fuel and is taking on water. In Italian waters, at a pace unmatched in recent years, a wave of migrant crossings continues. This, one of the latest, a fishing boat with 400 on board taking on water out of fuel and no captain, believed to be refugees departing from Libya but becoming adrift between Malta and Greece. According to a volunteer-run distress hotline, calls for help were ignored, with claims Maltese authorities ordered nearby ships not to rescue the boat, only supply fuel. There need to be an investigation of what happened, you know. Why a fishing vessel that was in Greek search and rescue area need to arrive to the Italian search and rescue area to be rescued. This is my question, but I don't have the answer. The answer is in the hands of the governments. No response from Maltese authorities, but finally, as the boat made its way to Italian waters, the Coast Guard there responded. And it wasn't the only Italian call out this weekend. With over 2,000 people picked up, including 1,700 refugees, reaching the island of Lampedusa in 48 hours alone. Dozens have lost their lives so far this year in the Mediterranean Sea, including children after a shipwreck in February. Charities are worried about more to come, as official figures show the numbers making boat crossings this year are up nearly fourfold with an expectation this summer may become overwhelming. Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Thick sand storms hit China's capital Beijing, enveloping the city in a layer of thick grey dust. Beijing authorities issued a yellow alert warning for sandstorms, the third highest of China's 40-year colour-coded weather warning system. Australia has reached an agreement with China to resolve their dispute over barley imports. Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong said the latest sign of improving ties between the countries. Cambodian authorities deported 19 Japanese suspects back to their home country for alleged involvement in phone scams as Japanese police continue to crack down on crime groups based outside the country. Northern Ireland marked the 25th anniversary of its landmark 1998 peace accords, but the fragility of the province's truce was underlined as mass youths pelted police vehicles with petrol bombs during secretarian disorder. One of Russia's most active volcanoes erupted, shooting a vast cloud of ash far up into the sky and smothering villages in drifts of grey volcanic dust, triggering an aviation warning around Russia's far eastern Kamatka Peninsula. The Shiveluk volcano erupted just after midnight, reaching a crescendo about six hours later, spewing out an ash cloud over an area of 108,000 square kilometres. 
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with visuals of Ukrainian artistic swimmers who wants to prove to their government of their capability to perform in the 2024 Olympics. Stay safe and have a good night.